Before we begin today's video, we got a bit of a quick public service announcement, if you will. Um, for those of you who have been wise enough to just kind of not have the news on in the course of this crisis, good for you. I'm trying to keep most of it out anyway, because most of it's same old and it's pretty depressing. But something important you may have missed, and those of you who have been tuned in to every development and, and update in the story, you already know where this is going. Something relatively new just last week, the CDC has issued guidelines saying that you should, if you have to go out, be wearing a mask that covers your nose and mouth. Um, the idea here is twofold. One, it's going to limit your touching of your nose and mouth, a lot of which happens accidentally, and two, it's going to prevent, if you happen to be carrying this particular virus, you from spreading those germs to other people. So it's an act of charity for other people in the community around you to protect them just in case you happen to be affected and asymptomatic or carrying, etc. If you can get your hands on one that's mass produced and manufactured, great, good for you. If not, and you're blessed in the very special way I'm blessed and you have someone who's not only beautiful and brilliant and talented, but knows what she's doing with a sewing machine like Mrs. Holliday does, then you can get one of these handmade. It's machine washable. It's got a little pocket for a filter. And if you're really lucky, you have someone who can make one that actually suits your style and fabrics that fit your wardrobe. It's reversible. Anyway, guys, if you do have to leave your house to go to, say, the grocery store or other places to pick up essential items, you really should be wearing something like this. You really should be protecting yourself. I absolutely want to see every one of you guys come out of this healthy and safe on the other side when this whole thing blows over. So be safe out there, please. Thank you so much. Hello, and welcome back to our scripture class. Today, we're going to get into the first two chapters of Luke's gospel, the second infancy narrative. Now, previously, you read and outlined Matthew 1 through 2, and we spent some time talking about what it means and how it means what it means, how it goes about presenting information. Today, we're going to do the same thing for Luke. You've already read it. You've already outlined it, and today I'm going to take you on a brief tour through these two chapters. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than Matthew in this regard. I'm going to rush the New Testament, Old Testament stuff, because I am sure with the massive amount of background you guys now have in the Old Testament, and the lengthy experience you have from reading Mark and Matthew 1 and 2, that you've already been looking for Old Testament things, and that... Really, you know all this stuff already. So I'm just going to point them out as we run through briefly. And then I'm going to spend more time, after I've pointed out that Old Testament stuff I'm sure you noticed already, I'm going to look a little bit at the, the structure, the layout, how Luke goes about telling the story in such a way that's going to teach us not just through what he says, but through when and how he says it. And there's going to be a whole new layer of meaning we're going to learn to look for as we read. Um, so have your outline handy, have your Bible handy, let's get into it. Chapter 1 Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to, delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. Man, that's one heck of a sentence into it. All told, here's the idea. I, Luke, am writing for you, most excellent Theophilus. Notice that most excellent. This guy's some kind of higher up. Maybe Roman nobility or something else like it. Um, you know, go around calling just anyone most excellent. I'm going to tell you... A bunch of stuff you've already heard, the stories about Jesus, and I'm going to do it in an orderly way so you can see truth about it. Now that's an interesting thesis statement from Luke and an interesting opening because we're going to look carefully at the order in which he presents things as part of how he teaches. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, 
there was a priest named Zechariah. Now Herod, king of Judea, you've already met. We're familiar with him. But Zechariah, now that name doesn't sound familiar, right? That's not a Old Testament prophet we read or anything, is it? Nah, that can't be right. He had a wife. Her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous, etc., etc., but they had no child, because Elizabeth, Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. That story doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? The old man and his old wife, too old to have children, even though that's what they want, who God is going to provide a miraculous child for when they're way too old to conceive naturally. We've never heard this story before, right? Nah. Anyway. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, etc., etc., there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, think back to that diagram of the sanctuary and temple complex that you copy down. That's right, I'm expecting you to still remember that diagram. Where's the altar of incense? It's deep on the inside, in the holy place, isn't it? And while Zechariah is there, offering incense at the altar of incense, an angel appears, and Zechariah was troubled, and fear fell upon him. We've definitely never read a story before about someone who suddenly finds himself face to face with an angel inside the holy place to receive an unusual and special mission from God, right? Nah, that's definitely not something we read before. Your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, etc., etc. The miraculous son promised to someone because of their faithfulness to God, even though they're too old to conceive? What a novel idea. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Hold on to that idea that this child, the son of Zechariah, is somehow associated with Elijah. We're going to see that come up a lot. <laughs> and you will be silent and unable to speak until that day. When these things have come to pass, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Zechariah leaves the temple that day, mute. And the people know something happened, and they can't tell what, because he can't tell what happened. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she hid herself. Thus has the Lord done in the days when he looked on me, etc. Does this feel very Old Testament to you? It should. And there's good reason for that. In the sixth month, I want to take a moment and point that out. I'm in chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month. Um, that's the sixth month since the last thing we saw happen. That means um, Elizabeth has been pregnant for about six months. Just so we know when we are, that timeline is going to be helpful later. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. This is all familiar. These are the characters we met. These are the people we met in Matthew's gospel. Joseph, who is descended from David. Nah, that can't be significant. And Mary, the young woman, the virgin to whom he is betrothed. They're committed to be married, but not yet living together. Um, the angel came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And he's talking to Mary. Hail, Mary, the Lord is with you. Hail, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, if we were speaking in older English. Huh, I wonder why that sounds familiar. Hail Mary, full of grace. Anyway, by the way, hold on to that full of grace line. We're going to come back to that later, and I'm going to argue that that's very significant in a later lecture when we try to pin down who Mary is and who Jesus is in these stories. 
She was troubled. What sort of greeting might this be? And the angel said, Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God, etc. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. We've heard promises like that before. And we've heard them associated with the house of David before. But I'm sure that's all a coincidence. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. There's that Holy Spirit conception thing again. We talked about that a little bit in Matthew. And again, that's uh, a term, an idea we haven't really pinned down and defined yet. Don't worry. We will spend a whole other lecture trying to pin down exactly what we mean by Holy Spirit, conceived, Mary, Jesus, Son of God, etc. We'll get into those later. For now, I'm going to continue with our short tour of this story of these two chapters. Um, but don't worry. If you're wondering what that means or, or worried about how that fits with everything, your head's in the right place and we're going to come back to it. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Let it be done. There's a word for that in Latin. We use four little words in English. In Latin, they just use the word fiat. Let it be done. Let it happen to me. This verse is so important. It's got its own name. It's called Mary's fiat. Let it be done. It's a, a, an I consent in a radical way to whatever God has in mind. Even if I don't necessarily understand all this, I'm in. Let it be done to me according to your word. Whatever God wants, that's what I'm going to do. And Mary is now pregnant with Jesus after this exchange. That's a big deal. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Mary just heard from the angel Gabriel that her relative, Elizabeth, was pregnant and has been for six months. So Mary hurries over to where her relative Elizabeth lives to visit with her and to help her through the difficult last few months of her pregnancy. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the child leapt in her womb. Think of that. The child leapt in her womb. She was filled with the Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you among women, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Man, why does that older English sound so familiar? And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Elizabeth seems to know before Mary has said a word, before she's even in the door visiting her at her home, that Mary is pregnant, which is a surprising thing to know, given that she's not supposed to be pregnant yet. Um... And it's a surprising thing to know, not just that she's pregnant, but pregnant in a way that somehow fulfills what God has planned, right? The mother of my Lord, that somehow this child is Lord over Mary, Elizabeth, etc. How does she know all that? Well, she tells us she attributes it to her son, John, to her six months pregnant, not yet born, but already active and communicating through this particularly, well, expressive leap in the womb to John. And this part, I think, is one of the funniest moments in all the Gospels, and everybody misses it. Look carefully at verse 45. Blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, I need you to picture the scene in order to understand what's so funny here. Elizabeth, six months pregnant, 
Mary shows up at the door, also pregnant, even though we can't see that yet. But she also received a promise from God, like Elizabeth did. Although, remember, Elizabeth didn't receive the promise, Zechariah did. So you have to imagine that right next to Elizabeth is Zechariah standing here. Still mute. Now, with that image in mind, picture Elizabeth's word one more time. Blessed are you, Mary, who believed what the angel said to her would come true. Unlike somebody. Oh, she's roasting her husband. And his comeback? Oh, yeah, he's mute. <laughs> Again. When we read, try to picture the scene and see what's going on. Otherwise, you're going to miss a lot of great moments like that. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Um, we have this canticle here. I can't think of anywhere in the Old Testament where a surprisingly uh, pregnant woman sings a canticle out of thanksgiving for the situation of now being pregnant, right? That doesn't... Sound like anyone we read about, huh? Hmm. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now here's one you might not have noticed. Now I know you guys are experts in the Old Testament and at reading your New Testament with your Old Testament lenses on so you can see things like this, so you can see what the Gospel authors are trying to teach us. But you just might have missed this one. Mary spends three months in the hill country near Jerusalem. And she stays in the house of someone. And she stays until... Well, we'll get to that part. Next, we need to look at the birth of John the Baptist. The time came for Elizabeth to give birth to a son... Her neighbors and kinsfolk heard, etc., etc. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have named him Zechariah after his father, but his mother said, Not so, he shall be called John. Now this is what the angel had told Zechariah back in the temple, back when he could still speak. And Elizabeth here is doing what was asked of her husband. His name is John. He writes it down because he can't speak. And immediately his mouth was opened and he spoke, blessing God. Notice that word there, and he spoke, blessing God. It's an interesting way to describe it. All these things were talked about. What when the, the will this child be? And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Ooh, he prophesied. Zechariah the prophet, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Notice that theme, blessed. Zechariah speaks blessing. Zechariah opens his mouth and says, Blessed be. This answers our question from before. Mary spends three months in the hill country near Jerusalem, and she stays there until the house where she stays is blessed. And then she continues on her journey. She's going to go back to Joseph. Does that sound familiar? That exact structure, three months, hill country, house is blessed, then continues on. It should. Go back and search your notes. Pause right now if you need to. And when you find what happened in the Old Testament, according to that model, suddenly you're going to understand who Mary is. But if you can't find it, you'll just have to wait till next time. One last point, by the way. It's at the very end of the story of John being born. I'm in chapter 1, verse 80. The child, John, grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until his manifestation to Israel. In the wilderness, who do we know in the Old Testament who spends a large part of his time out in the wilderness? Mm. Remember I said that connection to Elijah? 
It's going to keep coming up. Chapter 2. The birth of Jesus. A decree goes out from Caesar Augustus about the enrollment, and Joseph goes from Nazareth, where he's living, to Bethlehem, to the city of David called Bethlehem. Now, in our last story, uh, in Matthew, when we read it, we already talked substantially about Joseph, descendant of David, in Bethlehem. So I'm sure you're already very keen to the Old Testament references here, so I won't spend a, a lot of time on it. And while they were there, the time came for Mary, etc. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Interesting, if you ever watch a movie or a play or a Christmas pageant, they spend a long time on Mary and Joseph and trying to find an inn and giving birth and wrapping him. Here, it's one verse. It's not the most important part of the story. But yes, it is worth pointing out. A uh, manger, because there's no place for them in the inn. They're in a barn. They're in something probably like a cave. And he's being laid where you would normally feed the animals out of them, like a trough. Um, this kid's not rich. This kid is poor. There's no room in the inn, presumably because they can't afford it. Because private rooms are a thing. But only if you got money. And if you're a woman who's on the verge of giving birth, you're not going to take a public area sleeping. So yeah, he's poor. In that region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds from Bethlehem? That doesn't sound familiar at all. And the angel said, be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy. For to you is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Christ, Messiah, David. Again, they're really teasing this out for us. This will be a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And suddenly, I'm in verse 13 now, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, and they sing, glory to God in the highest. Angels, choirs of angels, thousands of angels suddenly appear to sing happy birthday to this kid? Now that's on a whole level other than anything we've read before. We'll come back to that point soon. The shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this the thing has happened, and they find Jesus exactly as they expected to. And then, skipping ahead a little bit, I'm in verse 21. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. We're going to stop there for now. I know there's more to chapter 2. There's Jesus being presented as a baby, and there's Jesus as a child for that one story. Um, but we're going to hold up there, because there's well, more than enough material for us to get through. So I'm sure as you read, you already looked at the Old Testament references, and you were generally picking up on what they were trying to teach us about Jesus, and how he fulfills whole prophecies and characters and figures and eras of the Old Testament. But what I want to show you now is another layer of meaning that's specific to Luke. So take a moment, and we're going to look at the whole story together now. We're going to build a little structure to it. So, I'm going to do a brief run-through of the stories we just read. And I'm going to organize things for you just a little bit. And what I want you to realize is that Luke is showing us something about these characters, and something about the whole arc of his story, just in the way he lays things out. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We start with the angel appearing to Zechariah in the temple. And then the next story we see is the angel appearing to Mary. By the way, there's a name for this story. All the most important moments have names, especially in Luke's Gospel, right? This is the Annunciation. Uh, 
annunciation, announcement of good news. This is where we saw Mary say yes to the angel, let it be done. Her fiat happens in this story. Then we see what's called the visitation. Mary goes and meets up with Elizabeth. And then we go back to the Zechariah and Elizabeth and John story. And then we jump back over here to the Jesus story. We're doing kind of a zigzag thing. So here, it's the birth of John. And here, right after it, is the birth of Jesus. Also called, by the way, the Nativity. Do you notice something about that structure? Look what happens. We go from John towards Jesus. We go from John towards Jesus. Now that's not a coincidence. Now what's really interesting is what happens in here. Do you remember in this story what Elizabeth says? How it is she knows that Mary is pregnant with Jesus? She says John points it out to her. He's not even born yet. And what is he doing? Pointing towards Jesus. What Luke's done, just by the way he organizes his story, is show us who John is. And by the way, um, if you remember when we read in the beginning of Mark's gospel, it started with John the Baptist, right? This is that John. John, son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, is the one who grows up to be John the Baptist. He goes and lives in the wilderness until his manifestation to Israel, until he goes out and preaches and baptizes. And what does he do with that ministry? Point to Jesus. Point to Jesus. Point to Jesus. Luke has already implied that for us here. Who is John? Who is Jesus? One points towards the other. And that's not all. I want to show you something else. This story, the angel appearing to Zechariah, is full of Old Testament references, right? Zechariah and Elizabeth resemble Abram and Sarai, later Abraham and Sarah. Zechariah in the temple seems to resemble, to a certain extent, Isaiah, and other similar correlations. The old parents who have a new child. Likewise, down here, the birth of John, the miraculous birth of a miraculous child that brings great news to a village and a family who all come to visit. It looks a lot like what you would imagine the birth of Isaac looking like to, say, Lot and other members of the household of Abraham when he's born. Very much Old Testament. But now, look at these stories. There is something distinctly new about them. We've seen God have miraculous conceptions of barren women by their husbands before. But a miraculous conception without the husband? A virgin conception and birth? That's brand new. You're not going to find that anywhere in the Old Testament. It's similar. It echoes the Old Testament. But it also clearly does something new. And likewise, John is born. and There's a community gathered around. And he's given his name. Great. But Jesus? A million angels come out to sing happy birthday? And at the same time, the only humans who show up are a bunch of straggling poor shepherds? That's new. The old prepares for the new. The old prepares for the new. We pointed out in several places already how John is consistently associated with Elijah. Well, then what we have here is a new Elijah that is somehow greater and somehow unexpected. 
There were plenty of people to receive the birth of this child. But this one? There's plenty of precedent for the conception of this child. But not this one. Something new is happening here. And it's taking the things that went before, fulfilling them, reprising them, but also upgrading them and changing them and twisting them. It's not just the Old Testament redone. It's remixed and remodeled to do some new thing. And then we have this, the visitation at the center of it. And that's going to get us really to the heart of who Jesus is. And it's going to do it by giving us our clearest image of who Mary is. And it's that Old Testament reference I hope you remembered before. But if you don't, alas, you're going to have to wait for next time. Oh, and by the way, after chapter 2, which you outlined for today, if you look at chapter 3... Guess where it begins? With the preaching of John the Baptist. And it moves immediately into the preaching of Jesus. John to Jesus, the old to the new. Something we're familiar with, stories we've read and loved before, to something utterly unexpected. Luke wasn't kidding. Look back at chapter 1, verse what is it, two or three? It seemed good to me, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the, care, the things of which you have already been informed. Hey, Theophilus, you know the story, but I am going to order it for you in a way that's going to bring the truth to light. Luke wasn't kidding, was he? I did tell you as we go deeper and deeper, there's no bottom, right? And just wait till we see what we do for next time. I look forward to seeing you guys in the live stream today. Thank you so much. God bless.